Chapter 56. The JTEX Corporation. Terry Funk was preparing for a long program with NWA world champion Ric Flair, and was figuring that it might be his last big run. His brother Dory suggested that he ask me to handle his affairs during what was sure to be a grueling program for him. Even though I had just turned down managing Vader, and passed on Sid Vicious and Danny Spivey, managing Terry Funk was different. First of all I wouldn't be developing him, just watching out for him and taking care of his business. Second of all I had managed him on other occasions, like in Florida. Thirdly, after all Terry and I had been through together, how could I possibly say no? Anytime I could ever do anything for the Funk Boys, I did it. I've managed them both and wrestled them both, and we've always had a good relationship. When I became Terry's manager, I made things as easy as possible for him. That way, the only thing he had to concern himself with was the match itself. Everything else I would handle, his positioning on television, his interview content, angles, finishes, and things like that. Terry left all that up to me, because he knew who I was and what I had accomplished, and was comfortable with my choices. A great part of my success was the trust that I gained with the guys that I managed. Terry knew that if something needed to be done, I was ready to stand up and do it, and if there was something that needed to be changed, I was willing to fight with the office in order to fix it. And I never worried about getting fired. I just didn't care. Around this time the management started offering contracts to all of the talent. I told Jim Barnett that it would be a conflict of interest if I signed one, because the great Muda and Terry Funk could no longer look at me as a free agent looking after them. Call me crazy, but I felt that as someone who manages talent, if I had a contract with the company, it would be a conflict of interest, because I would be expected to do what was best for the company rather than for my guys. I was old school though and my whole life had been on a handshake deal. I didn't need a contract. I was a man of my word, and that's what I lived on. Don't cry for me, though, because I will say this, I made as much or more than the great Muda and Terry Funk made, because I was heavily involved in both of their programs. Jim Barnett understood what I was doing and made sure I was financially very well compensated. I could have easily signed the contract, gotten an extension, kept my mouth shut, and made light of the situation, but that wouldn't be me. Terry Funk's matches with Ric Flair were drawing big money, but during their run Terry got an infection in his arm. Over a period of three weeks, his arm kept getting worse and worse. It was discolored, oozing puss, and sickening looking. It also had an aroma to it, and it didn't smell healthy. Anyone who knows Terry knows he doesn't complain about being hurt. Every night as I wrapped his arm up, I would nag Terry you've got to take time off. I'm wrestling the nature boy on top in full buildings, making money, and you are too. He would argue. That's true, I would concede. However, your arm is really bad and it's beginning to smell. Even with his Terry Funk attitude, he got to the point where he was physically unable to go out and perform every night. No amount of money is worth risking your arm over, and it was obvious to me that he needed to go to the hospital, so I told the booking committee, the people responsible for taking care of the talent, that Terry had to take time off to recuperate his arm. They just looked at me and said that he said he felt fine. You know how Terry is, I argued. Finally, I told Terry, I don't care what you or the booking committee thinks. I'm taking you to the hospital right now or I'm calling your wife and telling her about your condition. Don't do that. He panicked. My girls will go crazy. I don't care. You could end up losing your arm. Terry is an old war horse and will never accept defeat. It wasn't until under threat of me calling his wife that he finally agreed to go to the hospital. After getting him to the hospital, I called his wife and told her that he was okay, but in the hospital. She immediately jumped on a plane and came to see him. By that time, Terry and I were friends for 23 years, and nobody knew him better than me. If I hadn't made him go to the hospital, he would have kept wrestling and gotten a staph infection that would have put him out of the business for good, where he would have gotten a block clot and ended up dead. I brought Dick Slater in to replace Terry in his matches, and the fans made somewhat of a fuss over that. Of course I understood that people were upset that Terry had to cancel some shows, but believe me, he was in no condition to wrestle. He was sick and only getting sicker, and seriously had to stop. Besides, it's not like I picked Dick Slater out of thin air, or just threw a dart on the wall. Dick and I had a long history together, and it made logical sense for me to bring him in. Dick was in excellent condition at that time, and did a great job subbing for Terry. In addition to Terry, I had to worry about the great Muda's health, as well. The great Muda used the moonsault as his finish, and would land on his knees to protect his opponent. He took a tremendous pounding on his knees night after night, and started telling me, Gary son, I don't know my knees. Japanese people will not admit to injury. In their culture, to succumb to pain is a sign of weakness, so I knew he was in serious pain. 
in order to protect his knees, I came up with two other finishing maneuvers for him to use at house shows. One was where he would figure for his opponent's head and put him to sleep, then stand over his opponent's body and blow the guy green. That always got a big pop. Another move was where he would lay his opponent down on his belly, apply the figure four, and then lean backwards to grab his opponent's head. Then when his opponent gave up, he would blow the green mist up in the air and roll out from under it so the mist could settle on his opponent. That was also spectacular looking. I understood the importance of doing the moonsault on television, however, because the people waited for that moment in the match when he would do it, so we saved the moonsault for TV only. As time went by, after I would lay out the finish to the referee at the house shows, I would get word that the booking committee wanted the moonsault off the top rope. They couldn't have cared less what kind of pain he was in, and were willing to take advantage of the Japanese mentality and use him until he was a cripple. The great Muda also developed a hematoba on his stomach wall. He got that from an incident stemming from a match at the Clash of the Champions in New Orleans, when he wrestled Steve Casey. Steve was wearing these big oversized boots to make him look taller, and when he kicked the Great Muda with the point of his boot, he really laid into him and tore the outside of the Great Muda's abdominal walls. Once it got to the point where the Great Muda could hardly get out of bed in the morning, I asked the booking committee to give him some time off. In their infinite wisdom, they figured I wasn't really looking to get time off for the Great Muda, but for me, instead. I actually got a phone call from Eddie Gilbert, saying, Gary, we're giving you the week off, but we're going to keep booking the Great Muda. I went off on Eddie, screaming, the Great Muda is the one who needs the time off, not me. As soon as I got off the phone with Eddie, I immediately called Jim Barnett, yelling, Jim, in all the years we've known each other, you should have known me well enough to know that I would never complain about my guy just so I could get myself some days off. I don't need any time off, the Great Muda is the one that's injured. Would you like me to bring him to you so you can see the hematoba? It will be obvious that this kid is in pain. For them to think that I was trying to hustle a few days off for myself using the great Muda as an excuse was insulting to me, and it showed their total incompetence. By the way, given that I have pulled no punches when discussing how certain wrestlers used prescription medication to deal with their injuries, I think it's only fair that I also point out Terry Funk and the great Muda as perfect examples that not all wrestlers with injuries revert to medication. Most of them endure the pain. Terry Funk and I were trying to come up with a big idea for his return from the hospital when we came up with the now infamous bag angle. There was a clash of the champions from Columbia, South Carolina, and Terry and I decided to attack Ric Flair, put a bag over his head, and suffocate him on national television. We were really worried that, because we were doing it after his match, Rick wouldn't be able to get enough air. After having a long, grueling match, which was Rick's forte, it's not uncommon for wrestlers to get winded, and it becomes very hard to breathe. Therefore, if you ever see a tape of the angle, you'll notice that before I leave, I walk around the pole and look right at Rick to make sure he hadn't really suffocated before I left. That angle was way over the top for TBS, and their phone lines lit up moments after we did it. People were incensed that Terry and I tried to suffocate someone on TV, and it was so controversial that when the clash re-aired two hours later, they did not run the bag angle. After the fallout, Jim Hurd wanted to know exactly whose idea it was, and I ended up taking the heat for it. Interestingly that particular angle is still a hot-button issue, because when the WWE put it on their Best of Ric Flair DVD recently, England made them take the bag angle out before it could be sold over there. Since I was managing the Great Muda and Terry Funk, I came up with the JTEX Corporation by combining Japan and Texas. The NWA had a slew of managers at the time, so by calling myself the executive director of JTEX, I felt it presented me in a different light much like when I came up with Han H., Limited JTEX was an organization within an organization, and a way to separate us from the other talent, because I always felt that the little things were just as important as the big things. People picked up on it right away and really liked it. Jim Ross really helped, as well, because he painted the picture that it was a big corporation of Japanese and Texans and we were making an invasion. He was very helpful with that angle. I even put Terry Funk and the Great Muda together as a tag team, which apparently was something of a big deal, given Terry's allegiance to All Japan and the Great Muda's ties to New Japan. Anyhow, they teamed up for a Halloween Havoc pay-per-view where they wrestled the team of Ric Flair and Sting in an electrified steel cage match. This was based out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, so Bruno Sammartino was brought in to be the guest referee that night. Bruno was very friendly and cordial to me, and wasn't as cold as he had been in the past. As I had mentioned, the cage was electrified, and it had all of these Halloween decorations on it. Right before the match started, Someone turned on the electricity, and way up on top of the cage, one of the decorations caught on fire. The great Muda saw that and immediately scampered up the top rope and blew it out with his green mist. I was so proud of him. 
Terry was then booked for an I Quit match against Ric Flair at the Clash of the Champions in Troy, New York. The finish was that Terry would quit, I would get mad at Terry, Terry would attack me, the Great Muda would come to my rescue, and then Terry and the Great Muda would start a feud. Remember, the match was supposed to be an I Quit match, but the booking committee switched it at the last minute to an I Quit wrestling match, and retired Terry Funk. That night after his match, the Great Muda came down to jump on Terry with me, just as we had planned, but their feud never happened. Terry and the Great Muda would have done great business in the ring, but instead the booking committee put Terry in a situation where he had an interview segment called Funk's Grill. Then, they never followed up on him, and just ignored that he was there. If the booking committee were men of their word, and if Terry and the Great Muda actually did get to have a program, Terry and I would have come up with a way for us to double-cross the Great Muda and make him the babyface. Like I mentioned earlier, I would have had no problem doing that when the time was right.